quiet. Wonderful, beautiful. I suppose when the sun finally does come out again in Colorado, that many of us will have our own stories to tell of our encounter with the floods and the storms. Well, I have one last night. I was coming home from teaching at um, a seminar in Islam down in Littleton, and I arrived at the intersection of I-225 and Parker Road as it was the eye of an amazing storm. The hail was coming down, the rain was coming, that my white wipers is on the highest speed I could hardly see. And I began to think about how important vision is. And then one of these guys in one of these big SUVs goes flying by and covers my car with a whole sea of water and I couldn't see a thing. And I just thought, Lord, that song be thou my vision. <laughs> And I just was reminded how critical vision is. When you can't see, you just kind of get panicky and you, you don't know where you're going. It seems so obvious. But on this first Sunday of the second 50 years of Faith Presbyterian Church, it seemed appropriate to talk about vision. Because the visions that brought this church into being are long in the past, and now we're standing here in, in, in 2013 and looking for. Often when we speak of vision, we think of a church having a vision, but I want to speak of a personal vision, your personal vision, what you see God leading you to do. And so if you'd open your Bibles to Nehemiah, the first chapter, I love Nehemiah, not only because the setting was in Iran, but because Nehemiah is just a, a hero of mine, a leader, a man of God. And before I read chapter 1, I'm going to read a verse in chapter 2, which tells us that Nehemiah had a special vision to rebuild the walls, very specific from God. And he says in verse, chapter 2, verse 12, I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. And when I came to that verse, I went back to the beginning of the book and I thought, well, what was it that set Nehemiah up to, to have this vision? How did this vision was given to him? How did God put it on his heart? And I ask you the question, uh, how do you know God's vision for your future? And I believe this morning we're going to find in the principles of Nehemiah's life, his walk with God, his sensitivity to his world, his sensitivity to his own abilities and his own position, how God brought all of those together and put a vision on his heart. And I believe today that, that God has brought you here today to encourage you and inspire you with a vision for your future and how to serve God. So let's read the Word of God from Nehemiah chapter 1, and uh, we'll read it, and then I'll pray and we'll get into the message. Reading from the NIV, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the twelfth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you and, uh, and write for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commandments, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction 
you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commandments, then even I, your exiled people, are at the farthest horizon. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in reverting, revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer of the king. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these amazing words from so many years ago of a man who loved you and his heart was broken for the needs of your people. And we pray today, Father, as we explore the dynamics of his heart and his life, and how you gave him a vision for how he could serve you, how he could be a part of your divine plan on earth. We pray today that you would open the windows of heaven and speak to us as well. We pray that you would touch our hearts with the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would adjust our hearts that we might, like Nehemiah, come and confess our sins before you and surrender our lives to you and seek your face. I pray today, Lord, that you would anoint my lips with the power of your Holy Spirit, that I might speak under the authority of your guidance and your care, that all that I say may be pleasing to you, and that you would give each one of us ears to hear and hearts to believe and wills to obey. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What is a vision? Now, that's an interesting question, and there are many different answers, but a very simple answer might be uh, seeing uh, what God wants to do in the future through your life. That's simple. Having a picture of your future as God leads you. Now, we have to be careful as we uh, look ahead because uh, they're, they're, the future is something that's in God's hands. But each one of us uh, can be given a vision for what God would want to do. Now, we have several characteristics of a biblical vision, and one is that it is really God-given. Uh, God gives that vision. He gave Joseph a vision through a dream of what his future would be. So some visions uh, tend to be very miraculous and very spectacular. He gave Moses a vision about how he should, was going to set the children of Israel free. Uh, those are unusual types of visions, but I do believe that God gives vision through the working of the Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives. I think of when I was about 19 or 20 years old and was in college and I had no idea what my future should be. Uh, my idea of success was to survive the next exam in college. And uh, I, did, I didn't know anything. But I went one day sitting in the, in the church service. Uh, at that point, Dr. Glenn Connect was my pastor in college. And um, I, I don't know what he preached on that day, but God gave me a vision as I was sitting there and I was facing the fact that the next day I had to declare my, uh, my major in college, I heard the Lord say to me in a very specific way in my heart, I'm calling you to be a pastor. And so God gave me a vision. He wanted me to be a pastor. And that vision has kept me and, and I've never doubted it through all my life. It was in a circumstance of, of seeking God and facing certain circumstances that God gave me a vision. So vision is God-given, and He wants to give you a vision. Now, vision should not be mistaken with ambition. Uh, sometimes we have grand visions about what we'd like to do or be, particularly when we're younger. We think we're going to shake the world and change things. And, and vision is not saying, God, here's what I want to do for you, now just let me do it. But rather it is being submissive and letting God open that to it. Now, another thing about biblical visions, which uh, you may or may not have thought about, God often kills visions. Visions often die. And uh, we know that, for example, David had a vision, what? To, to, to build a temple. But because of his own unfaithfulness, God didn't allow him to see the fulfillment of that vision. So, so sometimes we have visions, and because of 
of our weaknesses and our faults, you know, God doesn't let us get to that vision. And sometimes He changes the vision. Uh, you know, both uh, the Mebergs and, and myself, we had visions of serving in different countries, and all of a sudden you know God has changed the vision. And He does that for us to learn to depend upon Him. So why does God want you to have a vision? Why is vision so important? You know, isn't it, can't we just leave that to the pastors and the leaders of the church, and can't we just go on and live our lives? Why, why, why is vision important? And there's a proverb that has always been in my heart, and I remember I memorized it as in the King James version. That's Proverbs twenty nine eighteen. It says, "Without a vision, the people perish." The NIV says this: "Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Where there's no revelation, where there's no leading of God." People, people come out of their banks. People like rivers don't know where they're going. And we think we've learned to see how important the banks of rivers are in keeping the water going. Now, I think you followed the story of Diana, is it Nyad, the lady that swam from Cuba to Florida? Do I have that right? And uh, I think she tried four times before she was successful. And if I heard her right, she said, the times I failed was when there was fog and I couldn't see the goal. I couldn't see where I was going. And so the reason vision is important is without vision, you lose energy. Without vision, you lose purpose. Without vision, you lose that determination. And if you have no vision for your life from God, then your spiritual life and your energy is probably just, just, just sort of chugging along there. Now, you might say, well, Tat, you know, vision is for young people, but I want to tell you the story of a lady who was 105 years old. She was in a nursing home uh, in a uh, suburban D.C. where I was pastor. She'd actually been a missionary to Turkey at one time. And when I went to visit her with a very raspy voice, she said, Tat, every meal I sit at a different table, and I'm going to talk to every one of these residents about Jesus before I go. At 105, she had a vision. So, you know, in the Bible, age does not stop you from vision. Moses got his vision at 80. Uh, and uh, Caleb got his vision at 82. He said, Lord, give me another mountain. Give me something more to do. And so maybe if you would really like to live a long life, have a big vision. My grandfather lived to be 100. And I asked him what the secret was. And he said he always had a plan. <laughs> And he always had a plan, what he was going to do. When you stop having plans, when you have aspirations, when you stop having vision for what God can do in your life, you're on your way out. So grab a vision. Let God show you a vision. Well, as we look at Nehemiah's experience, there are really three components that create his vision. And the first one is, is that his passion shaped his vision. And this is really important because passion really does shape vision. Passion really does determine what your purpose is going to be. Now we look at Nehemiah's passion and there were two things that ignited his passion. Two things that made him passionate about God. Passionate about his faith. Now when I use the word passion, I mean something that is, is of primary importance, something that is vital to you, something that you're willing to sacrifice for, something you're willing to even lay down your life for. We talk about Jesus' passion, and we mean that which was so important to Him that He was willing to lay down His life. And you know, many of us have lost passion because we live in a society that says everything goes, everybody's okay, and we're afraid to be passionate about Jesus because we know that we will become opposed by people if we are passionate. So don't let you lose your passion. What was it that created Nehemiah's passion? First, we see he was a man of deep faith in God. He, had a, he obviously had a pretty good prayer life, don't you think? Uh, he spent days in praying. Well, later, we're going to find out that there were six months of prayer between when he got the news and when he actually went before the king. He was a man who learned to wait upon God, a man who had a heart for God, a man who was looking to God. And he was a man, secondly, who was touched by the broken walls, touched by the needs of this world. He was not passive to it. He was touched by the fact 
uh, that the walls were broken and to be a man or a woman who's touched by the fact of what the darkness of this world is, of how the gospel has not gone to many countries. It is to be touched by that. Now, once you have in touch with a need, it often spurs a vision. Uh, I was in about my fourth or fifth year at Church of the Atonement, and I was feeling like the church just needed a revival. Uh, people were listening to sermons as if it were entertainment. People were listening to sermons, but they, there was just no spiritual movement or hunger in the congregation. And my wife felt that sense, and she said, Tat, I believe we need to have a prayer ministry while you're preaching. She got that vision. And so all through the winter she climbed to the highest part of the church in a cold little room and invited people to be praying while I was preaching. And as that prayer ministry began to occur while I was preaching, I began to sense a new freedom in my own preaching. I began to see God at work. My wife had that vision, Patty had that vision, because she was sensitive to the need. There are needs all around you in this church and in the world. Are you sensitive to them? Are you asking God how you might be a part of solving those needs? Well, what is the power of passion? Passion, of course, is what you will die for. And the power of passion is that when you become passionate about Christ or passionate about God, then that becomes your preeminent force in your life. And it drives what you want to do with your life. Now, Dr. Nuri... Uh, had been a professor at the University of Tehran and he taught world literature and when he came to the United States he found out that I had baptized his daughter and uh, to the Christian faith and he was very unhappy about that and so he decided to come to the Persian worship services in Washington and sit on the front row with a big notebook and write down all the mistakes that I made in my messages so he could prove to his daughter that she'd made a mistake and become a Christian so when I asked him what he was doing, he said, well, I'm making notes on your mistakes. I said, well, join the rest of the congregation. <laughs> They're making notes on my mistakes as well. Well, after about six months, he called me and he said, uh, I want you to baptize me. And I said, Dr. Nuri, uh, 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 fill me in. And he said, well, first of all, during the six months, I've read the New Testament 80 times looking for its mistakes. And then he said, uh, the Lord came to me in a vision and showed me that this is all true. I want you to baptize me. So his baptismal day came, and after we baptized him, he got up from his baptism and he said, now I want you to commission me to Iran as a missionary. And uh, his wife, who's a Muslim, was sitting in the back row, and she got up and yelled back at him, honey, you can't go to Iran, they'll kill you. And so now we have a, a domestic discussion going on in church. <laughs> and he said, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. God is calling me. I have this vision to go back to Iran, and I want to go. It's preeminent to obey Christ. And he went to Iran, and he wrote me from Iran. And he said, I've started a Bible study with all the retired professors, and six people have come to Christ. You see, well, vision is casted by your passion. If your passion is to have a cabin up in Estes Park, which you might want to rethink now, uh, then that is what your, your vision is going to be. But is your vision to glorify Christ? Is your vision to use these years remaining in your life to make a dent in Satan's kingdom and to add more to the number of those who will be in glory? Then you'll go forward with vision. Vision also is really what has your greatest influence on others. This is something that I've become convinced of, that the influence your life has on others is more but what you're passionate about than anything else. And so if your passion is to have the perfect golf swing, if your passion is to, to, to have more cruises than anybody else in your circle of friends, then that's what you'll do. But if, you're, if your passion is for Christ, the influence you leave on others will be Christ. So we see that Nehemiah was a man whose passion was fed by his relationship to God, and he was passionate about responding to the needs that God put in his pathway. We can't help all the people of the world. We can't help all needs. But God brings certain needs to our attention. And God brought to Nehemiah's attention the condition of those that remained in Jerusalem and the broken walls. Now, the second component of how Nehemiah came 
to his, to his vision about the walls was clarified by his position in life, who he was. You see, passion needs, needs some restraints of reality. A lot of people's vision and a lot of people's passion is beyond, beyond belief because of the situation that they're in. So what really retunes our vision and our passion is the realities of our life. Now driving, you know, driving, uh, driving on, on Iliff Avenue and, and, and watching the current change me from lane to lane, uh, I realized that, that, that these waters need restraint or they become destructive. And your passion and your vision can be destructive unless it is restrained by the realities of who you are, the circumstances that you're in. And so we notice that Nehemiah had a particular position. He was the cupbearer of the king. If you do a little more research into his life, he was an extremely wealthy man, a prestigious man. He had access to the king, the king who had ultimate power. Uh, the king could decree your death. He could decree anything about you, and he had access to him. What an interesting position. What a phenomenal position Nehemiah had. And he was also a man of wisdom and prayer. He used his position. He used his gifts in his circumstances. God had given me a vision to work with Iranians many years ago. Uh, and I did that as a pastor of an American church for 12 years. And then a particular statistic was given to me, which reshaped my direction. I read that 9% of the world speaks English. And 90% of all trained pastors minister in the English language to the English world. And I thought to myself, God has given me the ability to speak two other languages than English. What am I doing? What am I doing working in the English world? I have a responsibility because of the position I am in, the gifts that God has given me, the circumstances put me. He is, he is putting me in a position where I need to discern his vision in a new way. And so Nehemiah, Nehemiah, using his position, using what he thought, he prays and he prepares to go before the king. And he goes before the king and uh, he shows his sadness. And we're going to look at all the risks he took, but I'll just throw this in. You never went before Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, and ever showed any emotion other than you're happy to be in his presence. And you never initiated any request. If you remember how Esther was never to request anything, what a risk she took. And so you have to know that. Well, how can your position in life help you pursue, pursue your vision? Um, you uh, need to know uh, how to discern what God is using in your life. And when I was wrestling with leaving an American church as pastor to become a full-time pastor of 18 Iranian Muslim converts, first, when I shared that with many of my American friends, they said, you're crazy. They said, that's professional suicide. Here you are, a senior pastor of this church. You, you want to go work with 18 Muslims? I said, well, God is calling me to do that. But I confirmed that call in different ways. I went and talked to Iranian leaders. And then I, I did some Iranian conferences. And uh, I, first I would preach in, in English at the Iranian conferences, and somebody would translate. Then I realized the translator wasn't saying what I wanted to say. And so I told the translator to go sit down. I would try preaching in Persian. And in many ways, God confirmed that decision by these sort of things. And so how do you, how do you find out God's vision, you use your unique experiences, your unique abilities, and you put them at God's feet and see what He will do. Now, your faith determines if you will reach your vision. Now, Nehemiah's faith was a, a, a tremendous man of God because, first of all, as I've already alluded to, he risked death by taking this need to the king. I'll reiterate again. If you look at the dates of what when he first got this news, and when he went to the king, it was about five or six months he prayed about it. 
So he goes, prayed up, convicted that this is what God is going to do, and willing to risk his own life for the sake of his vision. Now that's passion. And also, I know he had faith because when the king grants him favor, he already knows what he needs for the trip. And he tells, if you go to chapter 2, he tells the king right off, he needs a letter of passage, he needs funds, he needs this. So he went into that, he went into that meeting with the king already believing that God was going to turn the heart of the king and he was prepared. And so when we follow God in vision, we become with preparedness and ready to go for the things he's going to do. He'd already been knew what he was going to ask for. And then in verse 8 it says, The gracious hand of God was upon me. Here's one of the most beautiful things. When you follow God's vision and you sense his blessing it and his touching it. My brother Bill uh, has been a businessman for most of his life. And now that he's reached about 60 years of old, he decided he wants to be in Christian work. He'd never raised support once in his life. And the reason he wanted to be in Christian work is that he'd been living in the Gulf states in Abu Abu Dhabi. And there he had been meeting with groups of Iranian Christians coming out. And he was seeing the incredible movement of God among the Iranians. And he got involved in that ministry. So he saw a taste of what God was doing. God created with him an, an image or a vision of what he should do. And he began to raise support. And God began to provide support. And now he's running a study center about 10 minutes from the the Dubai airport. And he has seen God's gracious hand upon him. At age 60, many of us would not be thinking about a new missionary endeavor if we'd never done it before. But he did by God's leading. And he is on fire. And his wife is on fire because of what they're seeing God is doing. How neat it is when the vision is given, we take it by faith, and we move out. How will you react to the vision that God may be giving to you? Are you open to Him giving you a vision? Are you open to praying about the needs that you see around you, your own family, your grandchildren, in this church, in this community? Or have you hung up your skates and said, "Ah, you know, I've done my duty? Or are you still open? Don't use age as an excuse. Nehemiah risked his wealth. He risked death. He risked failure. But he did it to bless the Lord. God God used him as he was willing to follow his passion and pray and surrender. You know, as we move into a new uh, time of season in the life of the church, particularly in terms of chronological, and as you perhaps move into a new season in your own life as we come into this fall, Wouldn't it be an exciting question for you to ask, Lord, what is it that you have for me? Let me see a future that I can be serving you. Because if you don't have a vision, if your your vision is just survival, like mine was, to get through the next exam, to get through the next pay period, get your bills paid, you know, if if that's it, then the Scriptures give you a warning. Without vision, the people perish. But I'm calling forth, in Jesus' name from you, life. Life and abundance, and life comes in movement, in giving, in surrender to the one who gave his life on Calvary for you, the one who died to bear your sins in his body and rose again. And the will of the Father and the vision of the Father is very clear when you get to the book of Revelation, where we see men and women of all nations and all tribes and all tongues gathered around the throne. Now, wouldn't it be exciting? to partner with God's vision and to give your life today to serve Him wherever you are with the restraints and limitations that you have by giving Him the opportunity to give you a vision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You allow us to see Your vision through the Scriptures and how, how blessed I know You are when Your children embrace Your vision. When your children who have benefited from Calvary, who have benefited from the forgiveness and the redemption of the cross, when your children who have reaped the bounty and joy of praying and seeing answer to prayer, when your children don't just want to receive from you, 
but they want to lay down their lives in serving you. How blessed you are, Father. And I pray today that you would freely move by your Spirit among us and show each one of us what your vision is for the days ahead, how we can serve you and bring glory to your name. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Sing our closing hymn number 562, Be Thou My Vision.